I want to tell you now about a very remarkable Englishman. His name was Alfred Russell Wallace. 200 years ago, well, 150 years ago, 152 to be precise, uh, a very remarkable book was published called The Origin of Species. It was by Charles Darwin, and most biologists will tell you today that it is the most important book in the whole history of zoology. It is the book that makes sense of the natural world. But when the paper in which Darwin first explained his theory of the origin of species was published, there were, in fact, two names attached to it, his own and that of Alfred Russell Wallace. The two men could hardly have been more different, but both men were obsessed by the natural world. Both men were collectors. Both men built up huge collections, for example, of beetles. Both men, as young men, wondered why there were so many different species of beetle. But Darwin, having done his, bo his beagle trip, came home. But how would uh, Wallace go to see the tropics of which he dreamed? Eventually, he thought of a way. He and a friend would go to the tropics somewhere and uh, collect specimens of beetles and birds and reptiles, snakes, lizards, mammals, and sell them to museums and wealthy collectors. They were working men. Because Wallace, as well as being interested in beetles, had one overwhelming passion. And that was for birds of paradise. Birds of paradise had been obsessing Europeans for 500 years. The first specimens came back after Magellan's expedition when he went round the world for the first time in 1522. And when they were in the eastern part of Indonesia, in the Moluccas, the local people gave him, gave him and his crew a very, very special gift. And they were several skins of a most extraordinary bird. From the sides of the bird, sprang enormous, gauzy, golden plumes. They in themselves were an astonishment. But even more extraordinary, these birds had no wings and no feet. And Magellan and sailors said, how come? How can there be a bird like that? The fact of the matter was that the local people in, in, in Indonesia, in Ternate, had no idea. They had come traded from some, some mystic place far to the east, which was in fact New Guinea. But they had to have a story. So they told Magellan's men, ah, these are very special birds. They float eternally in paradise. They have no need for wings, so no need for feet. And they feed on dew. <laughs> and when they came back to Europe, the sailors told people that. And this drawing was published in 1599 and was still reckoned to be the truth. These were birds of paradise. And at the beginning of the 19th century, there was this illustration, which showed how local people would see the bird itself in real life. Painted remarkably, by a man, a Frenchman, called Lesson. But when Wallace decided to go out and get birds of paradise, still no one had ever seen birds of paradise displaying their plumes in their courtship dances. So, and this was the center of birds of paradise plumes that were traded, and there, to his enormous delight and excitement, he saw the birds of paradise displaying for the very first time.
I should explain that there are 40, over 40, different species of birds of paradise. But the famous ones, the ones that first came to Europe, the ones with those golden plumes, were the greater birds of paradise. And Wallace saw them in display uh, and described it for the first time. But even when I started making natural history programs, no one had ever filmed wild birds of paradise in display. And then happily, after two or three visits to New Guinea and several attempts, we succeeded. The kinds of birds of paradise, he had also collected the smallest bird of paradise. They're sitting in front of him, down there. And we can see, when you look at them closer, that those birds are about the size of a thrush, and they have uh, their tails, uh, a, a curious little naked um, filament sprouting from their tail, uh, which in fact ends in the thing that looks like a coin, which has given the birds the name of dollar bird. The kingbird uh, is very, very different. It uh, not only has these strange things from its tail, but its coat, its plumage, is a wonderful, glittering, almost metallic red. And as Darwin described it, its plumage has an intense cinnabar red with a gloss as of spun glass, is what he said. That one night, the theory of natural selection leading to evolution of species occurred to him. It's a very simple one as you describe it, but it has huge implications. I dare say everybody here knows what the simple form is, which is that animals tend to give birth to many more progeny than, than will survive, and those that do survive have the best and most uh, effective characteristics which gave them that survival value. And they, in turn, pass that on to the next generation. And so, over many generations, new species arrive. It sounds simple, but in the implications are very complex and profoundly important. And he decided that he would send it to Charles Darwin. Now, Darwin um, had been uh, thinking about this problem himself. And 20 years earlier, he too had thought of the theory of natural selection leading to the evolution of species. Why hadn't he published this theory? Well, only he could say, of course, but there are a number of reasons, one of which is that it was going to profoundly, I was, he was sure, it would profoundly upset many Christian people in Europe, including his wife. He, of course, that declaration of the theory the, the publication, the announcement of the theory, uh, was done without uh, Wallace's agreement. How could he give it? He didn't know. He had one last trip he wanted to do. He found a new um, bird of paradise uh, that he was sure was going to be the most astonishing creature of the whole family. He called it the standard wing. And this is the illustration of it that he puts in his book. This extraordinary bird of paradise, which he found not in New Guinea. In fact, it's the only bird of paradise that really lives far away from New Guinea. Wallace had now been away for nearly eight whole years. The time had come to return home. And he found that the world, the Western world, was still thrilled and excited and outraged to some by a book that had just been published. It was The Origin of Species. Its full title, The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favoured Races in the Struggle for Life, had caused a huge sensation. The church was outraged because it left no room for the biblical account of uh, creation. But he met at last Darwin, this man who had also got his name attached to that remarkable book. And you might think that Wallace had every reason for being jealous and feeling that Darwin had stolen his thunder. Darwin, after all, had published that book. 
And the theory was called Darwinism, but not at all. They met, and Darwin said, you would, if you had my leisure, have done this work just as well and perhaps better than I have done. In fact, Darwin and he differed on the meaning of the birds of paradise. And Darwin was right and Wallace was wrong. Wallace thought that the males with their wonderful displays were, the, as it were, the main species and that the female differed from them because they had to be remained not so obvious uh, as they sat on their necks incubating their eggs. Whereas Darwin recognized that it was in fact the females who was choosing, choosing the males uh, that was the driving force of evolution. He called it sexual selection. And the reason it happened, as we now know, in New Guinea, is that New Guinea is so rich, it is in a very real sense a paradise for birds. There's a lot of fruit, a lot of insects, a lot of food of all kinds, and very few predators. And so it's possible for the females to build the nests by themselves and to incubate the eggs by themselves without any, any attention for the male. The male is only useful in order to fertilize the eggs before they're laid. And that theory of sexual selection uh, is now fully accepted. Well, um, one of the birds that Wallace described is this one. It's the, called the, uh, the uh, parotia bird, the six-wired bird of paradise. And that is rather different from the other birds of paradise because instead of displaying high in the trees, it displays on the ground. The fact that uh, there are very few predators makes that possible. And so these birds of paradise develop themselves, they clean whole areas in the forest as a stage on which the male will perform. And what is more, not only does the male dance there, but the immature males, before they've acquired the full plumage of the male, will come and watch and, as it were, learn the dance as the male performs it before they too become mature and set up uh, their performances on their stages. And Wallace may not be as famous a name as Darwin's, but in his old age, he was fully honored um, with all the academic honors from around Europe and elsewhere. He may also have differed from Darwin uh, on some details of the theory of the origin of species, uh, and Darwin has usually proved right. But his book is an amazing book. But he also says other profound things. I thought of the long ages of the past, during which the successive generations of these things of beauty had run their course year by year, being born and living and dying amid these dark, gloomy woods with no intelligent eye to gaze upon their loveliness. Such a wanton waste of beauty. It seems sad that, on the one hand, such exquisite creatures should live out their lives and exhibit their charms only in these wild, inhospitable regions. This consideration must surely tell us that all living things were not made by man. Many of them have no relation to him. Their happiness and enjoyments, their loves and hates, their struggles for existence, their vigorous life and early death would seem to be immediately related to their own well-being and perpetuation alone. Indeed, they do. Thank you.